Hello, it's Val Lem here. I'm happy to be joining you from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of several First Nations, most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'm happy to be here and I'm going to start sharing my screen. And go to present mode. So what I'm talking about today is an Asian Canadian in literary and cultural bibliography. So th this is an integrating online exhibition that I created, um, Asian Heritage in Canada. So I'll show you the landing page as it exists today. Looks something like this. And it, um, it's an online exhibit that's an integrating resource. So if you've got a cataloging background, you know that it just means that it's being updated. So a little bit about how this all came about. So uh, up to um, 2002, October, I had been working for um, school board and I saw a transition coming so I decided to take some courses in the foundation of web design. So when I started working at Ryerson University in the fall of October 2002, I wanted to be able to implement some of the skills that I had been learning. I thought a web exhibit that ties into Asian Heritage Month would be a great idea. And specifically, I wanted to raise awareness of cultural contributions in fields such as the arts, literature, history, and because it's a tie-in to Asian Heritage Month, I would include some information about events and organizations. And also, since I was going to have this hosted at Ryerson University and have some staff there helping me, I wanted to emphasize Ryerson University Library resources as well. So we had a very modest launch in May of 2003. I used the Wayback Machine to get an idea of what it looked like. Uh, very simple. It's not super nice. There's actually, uh, a, there was an image here of a map which didn't get captured. And to promote the website, I developed an online exhibit um, I mean, I created a bulletin board display with the help of a technician, Charlotte Broom. And also I had a vertical bookcase displaying some of the books. So Ryerson did not have much in the line of uh, physical display space. So that's why an online exhibit seemed to make more sense. But then this was going to help promote it. And it actually did, did work, I guess. So some of the ideas in, in the past, you know, what is a literary author? Who is an Asian Canadian writer? It's kind of complicated, as you can imagine, uh, because there's multiple diasporas, identities, individual people can identify with various backgrounds. But for simplicity's sake, you know, you might want to try to peg someone as a one ethnicity. Uh, being a literary focused, I wanted to emphasize people who published poetry, fiction, or drama. And initially, I wanted to focus on people who published works of merit. That is somewhat subjective. So I thought that could be gauged perhaps by thinking of people who'd won awards and other honors. I like the idea of including annotations, but not having the time to read everything and create annotations for everything. I thought maybe a summary or synopsis of the individual works would be a good way to include some of that kind of information. And as a tie into the library, of course, call numbers and catalog links would be very helpful. So we had a very modest beginning. Um, as of June 2003, when I looked at the Wayback Machine page for that month, there were only 47 individual authors identified on the author page plus a category called anthologies. 
And later on, I would realize I needed another category, autobiographies and memoirs. However, although I'd identified that many people, I only had 15 individual author pages created. And as an example of ethnicity, only four of those people were identified as Chinese Canadians or, ch or people with Chinese ethnic ancestry. So here you, you can see who they were, Wei Sun Choi, novelist, Larry Soleil, who that's a novel as well, Madeleine Thien, who initially published some short stories, and Paul Yi, who is primarily known as a children's writer. So here's an example of a screenshot of the author's landing page today. And you'll see that there are hyperlinks to author's pages. And I'm including on this indexing page names of people who I have not yet created an author page for. So it's a way for me to help keep track of some of the folks that I'm thinking of including. And it's also maybe a signal to people using the site that there's more content coming. So what would you want to see in a brief biography? This is a very personal hobbyist approach to uh, creating a site. So I want to include ethnic origins if it was known. And this is quite helpful in a case where the name itself does not suggest an ethnicity. I thought I'd include some information about what other fields the person's working in besides writing, what kind of educational background they have, if they've immigrated to Canada from another place, if they have left the country but are still Canadian in that broad definition of Canadiana, of having been born here, lived here, or um, having Canadian citizenship. Here's an example of a biographical write-up that I wrote for Paul Yi. There's a photograph. I include photographs when I have them. I can talk about that a little bit more. And um, one of the problems was, you know, should I cite my sources? We'll talk about that. Here's a current example of a page for uh, this author, Nadine Nima. So there's, if I had a photograph of her, it would show up here. It is a very brief biographical entry for her that I compiled. And in this case, she's only written one literary work. It's a work of, it's a juvenile picture book. I've got, um, you know, the category, the title, details, publisher synopsis, and I always like to include links especially if there are links available for the publisher's site and for the author themselves. And I find that's useful because people can go to the person's own site, find out pictures of themselves, of them, I mean, and how they portray themselves. The content's changed over time. One of my concerns has become privacy. So at one time I was including year of birth information and I've since removed most of that unless the person has already died. Uh, I always try to be accurate and update the information if things are pointed out to me. And in some cases I'm including some citation information. As far as photographs go, when I started off, I wasn't really super worried about copyright and permission issues. Over time though, I have tended to remove a lot of images that I had found on the internet. Um, so today I'm more likely to include photographs that I have taken myself and photographs that have been supplied by the subject. There's also the whole issue of uh, currency of portraits because you know someone who started writing in their early 20s and they're in their 60s now, you know, uh, a picture from their youth might not be the best thing to represent them. So, uh, you know, I do sometimes take down old pictures or, and replace them if possible. And of course, you want to be responsive to people's um, concerns and requests 
So I've had a few people ask to have their whole author page removed or to update personal information. So I always try to be responsive. Other things that have happened over time is I've included people who are not currently represented by the collection at Ryerson. And I mentioned already that I've had to add a category for autobiographies and memoirs because there was just so many of them and I thought they were quite important. I do want to include self-published authors. There is an awful lot of them and that represents the current publishing market. Rarely did I include someone who has not published at least a significant chapbook or standalone um, collection of poems, for example. But, you know, there's always an exception. So Winston Christopher Cam's an example. He's an important playwright because he wrote one of the earliest plays depicting Chinese uh, society in Canada. And that was in the 80s but the play was not reproduced in a standalone format. So uh, it's only available in anthologies. And I've had some authors ask to be included for their prose writing. So it's, you know, you wanna to try to keep the whole project manageable as a one person show. Because I'm a hobbyist approach, you know, I started with people I knew, I do lots of reading, I follow events in key publications at Quill and Choir, newspaper reviews, go to lots of book launches, literary events. I visit vendors at Word on the Street. Of course, used in new bookstores are always fun to browse when you're not in a COVID situation. And publishers, catalogs and websites are fabulous. And there are, of course, some key publishers to follow, people who publish a lot of uh, non-Caucasian writers in Canada, like Arsenal Pulp Press and Moensey House, Playwrights Canada Press, and there are a bunch of others that are very important. Anthologies can be a good source because you can find out um, from reading the biographies of the contributors if they've published monographs. Of course, there are also uh, online journals like Rice Paper, and there are published bibliographies. So a more scholarly approach to Bibliography making would include looking at existing bibliographies like John Miska's Ethnic and Native Canadian Literature. And that was actually quite useful in identifying some people who have published prior to 1990 in the English language. And of course, literary criticism is also a place where I found um, tips for people to look up. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's a graph just to show you that currently there's about 540 individual author pages. And I've tried to identify their ethnic origins. And I've got them listed here from Afghan through Chinese, Chinese Caribbean, um, Hong Konger, here's Indian but I've broken down Indian even further. So I also have an Indo-Caribbean category, Indo-Pakistani, because some people that's how they identify, but also related to India, there would be um, people who identify as Kashmiri. However, I decided, you know, if Census Canada is going to be capturing people's ethnicities, how they describe themselves, maybe I should as well. So therefore, right now, you know, there is maybe only one person identified under Turkey, um, Turkish, which is back here, but I have several who say they're Kurdish. Anyway, this is uh, just gives you a, snap, a graphical snapshot of some of the information in the website. I realized though that I might need to create a spreadsheet in order to get into more granular analysis of the information. So I could uh, use this kind of tool to filter and sort things by ethnicity, by um, literary form, by year of first publication, um, 
country of birth. One of the problems, of course, is like identifying the ethnic identities because often they're multiple. So I've always tried to peg one ethnicity as a, a main or valid grouping identity. So, you know, this might be subject to some change as I reconsider things. For example, I was thinking maybe I should have an Indo-African category because there's quite a few authors who came out of East Africa. Often they're Ismaili, but not exclusively. And, you know, their ancestral roots are from India, but also via Africa. So, um, I don't know. It's open to debate and I'll see how things go. So I think I've run out of time. Um, there's the website for the, um, the web address, but definitely this uh, information in the spreadsheet can help me look at trends and things like that. Um, and I'm hoping to do some more presentations later. For example, this fall, I'm hoping to give a presentation about Canadian diasporic writers who have come from the Middle East, or maybe even the Middle East and North Africa, although technically North Africa is not um, part of my original mandate. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to stop this and we'll chat later. <laughs>